Hello and uh, welcome to the event today. Uh, really excited to um, have you joining um, myself and Richard Thaler for a conversation about New Nudge. Um, today's event uh, will be an hour long and um, we're gonna go through a few things um, before we kick it off. But first off, I wanna say thank you everyone for joining. Um, uh, people from all over the world signed up for today's event. So whether you're having breakfast on the West Coast, lunch on the East Coast of the US, um, dinner in the UK and uh, Europe um, and, and the rest of Europe, uh, and or a nightcap in Asia and Australia, we're glad that you made the time to join us. So um, say hi in the chat and mention the city or the country where you're joining from. And um, before we begin, like I said, I'm gonna go over um, a few details about the behavioral scientists, the Crowdcast platform, and how today's event will go. So uh, if you don't know me, I'm Evan Nestrak. I'm the editor-in-chief of Behavioral Scientists. Um, you uh, probably welcome me to your inbox um, frequently um, if you are familiar with us. If you're, if you're not familiar with us um, and you're just getting to know the behavioral scientist, we're a nonprofit digital and print magazine dedicated to helping you make sense of and impact today's world through a deeper understanding of human behavior. We specialize in publishing expert commentaries from leading behavioral scientists and designers from academia, business, government, and the nonprofit sector. And you know, what we cover includes new research on human behavior and decision-making, emerging trends in the field of, of behavioral science, ways we can all better understand the news and the current events happening around us, and new perspectives on the timeless questions about who, who we are as humans and, and who we can be. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, you're in the right place. Um, and if you're not already, please sign up for our, our newsletter and um, you will see more of us in uh, the coming weeks. Uh, a few details about today's event. The session is being recorded. That means um, you'll be able to revisit the recording and share it with your friends. It also means that the chat and the questions are recorded. So please keep that in mind as you engage with others during the event today. So in general, um, please be mindful of your behavior. Uh, pretend uh, you know we're having a virtual dinner with Professor Thaler and uh, if he would kick you out if, if anything was got too out of hand. So if, if something if we do notice something's out of bounds, we'll, we'll deal with it promptly. Um, today's event will be an hour. Uh, the first half will feature a conversation between Professor Thaler and myself. The second half will take your questions. If you have a burning question, you can ask it using the ask a question button at the bottom of the, of the screen. Um, please do not put it in the chat. Um, the chat is great for connecting with um, other attendees during the event, but it'll get lost there. So please use the ask a question button. I um, mean, you can also upvote questions that, that you think um, you'd like to hear us ask. Um, and if you uh, do want to minimize the chat window, if you move your cursor up to the top right, um, you'll see a, a gray and white down arrow that um, uh, that you can click and the chat will be minimized. Uh, and you know, despite the vast amount of time we've all spent on online meetings and events recently, we know that glitch happens. And so we appreciate your uh, patience in advance if something does come up. If you personally run into any technical issues, we'll drop a link in the chat with resources that may help you troubleshoot. And as I like to remind myself, um, if anything tech related goes wrong in this, this new digitally connected um, uh, year or so, uh, the sun will rise tomorrow. Um, okay. Um, behavioral Scientist is supported um, by a number of organizations which you see on the screen. Um, they help make events like this possible. So um, we're really, really thankful um, that they've provided financial support to help us further our mission. So thank you to these organizations. 
And a few things while we have you before we kick it off that you might be interested in. Um, we do special uh, print editions and the, we've just announced the uh, print edition number two, Brain Meets World. And that's gonna explore um, the journeys that ideas take as they leave our minds um, and the ordered labs and enter the chaotic real world. Um, we're, at the, we're at the stage of gathering early support um, and those that do will receive a copy of the issue and um, a ticket to the companion virtual event. Um, and we've also just made our first print edition available. It was originally printed for a limited release um, at an event and for early donors. And so we've just made the copies we've held in reserve available. Um, and we'll share a link here in a second. <coughs> and uh, next is if you do need a copy of New Nudge, then um, we'd encourage you to uh, visit the Seminary Co-op Bookstore's website. Um, it's a legendary, awesome, independent bookstore in Chicago. They've got a great location right next to Booth. Um, if you're ever there, recommend it. And if you do want to support um, local independent bookstore, um, we've partnered with them to, for the, the books uh, at this event. Um, and, and one thing that's great about uh, the Seminary Co-op is that they have a cultural mission that, that um, extends beyond just selling books. It allows them to keep over 100,000 books on their shelves and work with like-minded cultural partners to you know, bring events like these and others um, uh, to you and to other um, book enthusiasts. So you can visit Sem Co-op to get your copy of Nudge or support um, a local awesome independent bookstore. That's for the end, we're not there yet. Um, there is a call to action down at the bottom of the screen. Um, it says more info, support, print plus nudge. That's the button you can use to kind of get any of the links that I just mentioned if you're interested in the print issue, if you're interested in getting that copy from um, the seminary co-op. And we're gonna stop sharing. All right, now we can dive into the questions. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome um, Professor Thaler to the screen with me. Professor Thaler, thank you for, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. This is gonna be fun. Okay, so I wanna start off uh, kind of right into the fire. Um, organ donation is probably one of the most memorable examples from the first version of Nudge. Um, one of the most cited examples, yet uh, your and Cass's view on the subject was kind of, uh, there was misconceptions about it and it's something you addressed in this book. So I'm giving you another chance to set the record straight here. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on organ, dona organ donation and uh, um, you know, what was the misconception that, that you wanna correct? Sure, thanks Evan. So when we started to write the book, um, we were aware of the famous chart by our friends uh, Eric Johnson and Dan Goldstein showing that defaults had a huge effect on whether people chose, quote unquote, to be uh, organ donors. And... Uh, the, I'm getting feedback here, so I'm I'm going to take my earbuds out and, to, and while I'm talking, um, the conclusion that many people reached from that is that defaults are the answer to this problem. Just make uh, becoming a donor the default, and your problems are over. And uh, people concluded without reading the chapter, I assume, that that's what we advocate. Uh, and truthfully, when we started to write the book, we thought, okay, that's going to be a natural chapter because we were aware of that graph. Uh, but once we decided to dig in and look at the research, we came to a different conclusion and advocated something that we call prompted choice which means ask and keep asking and make it easy and make it as easy as possible to join. Now, why don't we 
advocate presumed consent, uh, there are two reasons. Uh, one is we don't really think we should be presuming anyone's consent about anything. Uh, a second is that we don't think there's much signal value to people failing to opt out, especially in circumstances where almost no one does. But the proof is in the pudding, and our reading of the literature is that presumed consent doesn't work, that organs donated are on the order of magnitude of 25% higher in jurisdictions that have opt-in rather than opt-out. Now, getting a precise number on that is very difficult, and there's some confusion about which category Spain should be in, uh, because they once passed a presumed consent law and then a year later decided to ignore it. Uh, they have the best choice architecture in terms of dealing with prospective donors. And so they are way up there. And uh, if you put them in the wrong category, you're going to get a misleading result. Uh, so uh, we try very hard to straighten out the message here. And one of the themes in the final edition is we have to be careful about the way we think about defaults. They're not the answer to every question and in particular on this one. Thanks for clearing that up. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna also for the, for the next question. It's it's not gonna be an easy one either, and it's something that that you um, wrote a lot about, um, or that has changed a lot in the in the in the sort of twelve or so years since you wrote the the first first version. Um, and that's climate change. Um, so can you discuss your thoughts on the role nudging and choice architecture play in into fighting climate change and the, the kind of me mechanisms that we might um, fight climate change with, whether it be it uh, individual behavior, systems behavior. And, and there is a tension here between addressing those system-wide behaviors and individual behaviors that I'm hoping you might touch on in relation to climate change. Sure. So, Another of the major themes of the final edition, and it is the final edition, regardless of anything you might hear from my co-author. Um, he does write books, I think sometimes accidentally, you know, uh, in his sleep or something, but there will not be another edition of this book. Um, one of the themes is that you can't solve every problem with a nudge. So just like in our discussion of organ donation, in spite of that graph, yes, we can get 90% of people failing to opt out of uh, presumed consent, but that doesn't produce organs. Um, and nudges help on climate change, but uh, it's too big of a problem. So one of the things we say in various ways and repeat uh, throughout the book is nudge is part of the solution to almost any problem, uh, but is not the solution to any problem. And I am with, I think, 100% of economists around the world in thinking that step one, if we want to deal with this crisis, must be to get the prices right. Uh, economists are right about some things. And if, if you make something free, people consume too much of it. We see that at all you can eat restaurants or even worse, open bars. So right now, emissions are free and people are acting accordingly. So whether it's a carbon tax or cap and trade, we got to get the prices right. Now, that's easier to say than to do, but uh, the, the new meeting coming up in Glasgow, I hope that there's some consensus that we have to start pricing carbon. Then nudges can and do work, and we have lots of examples going back to the famous Opower study where you show people 
how much energy you're using compared to your neighbors or especially your more efficient neighbors. That helps maybe two or three um, percent. Now you can say, well, that's a small effect size. Um, but uh, uh, we quote uh, President Obama in this context uh, in the White House uh, where Cass served in the Obama administration, the president likes saying, better is good. So every two or three percent matters. And we it's wrong to sneer at things like that. That manipulation or that intervention costs essentially nothing. And if if we can take advantage of free opportunities to reduce emissions by two or three percent, that's going to add up into something meaningful. And I wonder if we might touch on a theme, sort of a meta theme, I guess, around nudge. I think on, on the one hand, um, there's been a proliferation of, of nudging or, or um, applied behavioral science. And I kind of like to think of the term nudge, it's almost like um, uh, Kleenex or Frisbee or, or anything like that, that's its own, um, uh, it's Google, you know, you don't search the internet anymore, you Google something. Um, you don't um, change behavior, you nudge something. And I think that ha that's been a blessing and a curse in a way because it maybe has missed that distinction between if we're changing people's behavior on climate change, um, people think of nudging and then they think of nudging as playing at the margins in some cases and not as, you know, complementary to, to larger issues. So I wonder in your, you you probably you've dealt with this um, conversation much more than I have, and so I'm wondering at, over the last 12 years, as you've seen the word nudge used and thrown around in different ways, um, you know, what's your perception of how it's being used correctly, how it's being used incorrectly, and um, how how you wish people would use it in the next going forward in the next five years, given you know we won't see another five or ten years, given we won't see another book. Yeah, uh, I'm. I'm not saying that uh, there won't be other articles or other books by Cass Sunstein. Uh, in fact, I think we can be confident there will be. Um, when we define nudge in the original book, and we haven't changed it, we we say strictly speaking, a nudge is something that affects our behavior without requiring anyone to do anything and without changing economic incentives. And uh, one way to think about it is nudges work on humans, but wouldn't work on econs, our, our term for homo economicus, the fictional creature that exists only in economics journals and textbooks. Now, of course, monetary incentives are part of the choice architecture. And I should say, nudge was not, the idea for calling the book nudge is an idea we owe to one of the many publishers who turned us down. Um, he said, well, we're having internal disputes in our house. We can't publish the book now. But, you know, it makes me think of the word nudge, which is kind of a fun word. And maybe that would be a good title. And... Uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, it helped, certainly better than libertarian paternalism is not an oxymoron. Uh, tens of copies might have been sold uh, with that title. I wish and fought originally and this time for a subtitle using the phrase choice architecture. The original subtitle of, back in 2008 was nudge the gentle power of choice architecture. And I just got vetoed. Um, so uh, the, the reason why I think that, uh, that I worry about that is people think of the book and the enterprise as tweaks. So it's like the old power thing 
or changing the or like the famous tax study where you talk about the messaging to people who who owe money yes that's in the repertoire but the you know the the reason why uh, I'm passionate about the organ donation thing is that we need to have a bigger picture of the choice architecture and the same with climate change uh, we, so uh, I don't really mind if people misuse uh, or use a more general version of nudge in their vocabulary I don't own the word. There's now a dog food called nudges that Cass buys for his two Labradors um, and for which we get no money thanks to my lawyer co-author who failed to take out trademarks and so forth. Um, so we don't control the word. Uh, anyone's allowed to do it, use it any way they want. Um, but um, let, let's keep in mind that it's really a book about choice architecture and practitioners and people in the business world and governments need to be thinking from that perspective, I think. That was, that was really interesting. And um, when I get a dog, I'm, I'm going to buy the dog food, but, uh, but, <laughs> I, but I, I do think, I do think the, the, the point is important to, um, to emphasize the choice architecture. And I can see why you're advocating for that in the subtitle. Um, and so I will, I will write it on my copy of the book. Um, Great. Um, I, you know, that this actually, what you were saying um, rem, remind, bring, brings up an important point. I, I don't think when you were writing the book originally, you expected that there would be over 600 um, behavioral science units in um, universities, businesses, nonprofits um, uh, around the ar around the world, um, and so I'm I'm wondering, and governments as well, and, and so I'm wondering, you know, what are you? It's a two part question, um, and you can pick which one you want to start with first: the good news or the bad news. Um, what are you worried about as you kind of see this rapid expansion? And what are you? Or let's go let's go deeper into it. And what are you excited about? Well. I I'm I'm mostly excited about so many people that, especially on the government and NGO side of this, that are committed to trying to improve choice architecture and, most importantly, testing. That that the one thing in common that all these so-called nudge units have is testing, and I was involved in the formation of the first one in the London branch of BIT, which now has over 200 people and offices all around the world. Um, but one thing we stressed early on is we don't know all the answers. We have some informed hunches, um, but we need to test. So that's great. And uh, we're learning a lot about what works and what doesn't. Um, w w but one comment that's related to that, which is there's a recent survey paper, um, the Stefano Delavina and Elizabeth Lino wrote, uh, looking at uh, all the uh, tests that uh, the uh, Obama um nudge unit ran and the the results are lots and lots of tests with statistically robust but economically small effect sizes uh like the two or three percent and i think some people conclude from that uh one of two things either that that just don't have big effects and or that there's some major publication bias um, because the the tests that make it into academic journals have bigger effect sizes 
And the, uh, I've had endless discussions uh, with Stefano about this. I spend uh, part of my time in Berkeley. So um, I think we have to be careful about what we mean by a publication bias. So uh, one way I've put that to him is, doesn't he think that articles that get accepted in the American Economic Review, where he's an editor, are better than articles that appear in less prestigious journals? And is that a publication bias? Or is that a reflection of very high standards? So uh, there are papers with big effect sizes that are nudges. Uh, Benarzi and I wrote one of them on Save More Tomorrow. Um, uh, Madrin and Shea wrote a the first important paper on automatic enrollment. Uh, enrollments in 401k plans went from 50% to 90% instantly. We know that effect replicates all around the world. The UK Nest system, which is essentially a national 401k plan, has le less than 10% opt-out rate. These are huge effects. Now, why don't we see that from nudge units? The answer is they don't have control of the choice architecture. So let me give you one example. There was a study that the uh, Obama team, Maya Shankar's team, ran uh, trying to get civilian member, civilian employees of the military to enroll in their pension scheme. But they were not allowed to use automatic enrollment. They, they, you, you guys, that's not in your toolkit. You can send text messages. You can communicate, blah, blah, blah. Well, we know, <laughs> we know what works. And if they could change the choice architecture, uh, the chances are 90% would be in. Now, if instead you you can mess around with messages that may or may not be read, uh, the effect sizes are going to be smaller. So I, I wish that we had, uh, in addition to nudge units, I wish we had choice architecture units that would help governments and corporations think about the choice architecture from a high level and uh, help improve that. And I'm not I'm, I'm now not sure whether I answered your question, but I think I went on long enough. I, I, I think I think it's an interesting point that um, we and I'd like to clarify or maybe have you expand on it a little bit. So when you say you wish there were choice architecture units, what do you wish the current behavioral science units did more of? Is that getting more upstream in the design um, process? Is it something else? Yeah, so let, let's take some of the uh, COVID relief packages that were passed um, during this in both, in both administrations. Um, and many of them were sludge ridden. So take the PPP program. If people around the world don't know what that is, it was a program meant to help small businesses like restaurants uh, that were really slammed um, by the shutdowns. And uh, in order to be eligible for that, you had to fill out an application. It helped a lot if you had a banker or a lawyer or somebody who could fill that out. It certainly helped a lot if you could speak English and you had a uh, good internet service and so forth and so on. So what did we see from that? Lots of people who were eligible didn't get it because they couldn't get through the sludge. The same is true for things like the some tax credits that are aimed at uh, people with families. Um, 
if you don't have a bank account, then it's almost impossible for the government to just send you the money. If you have been filing your tax return electronically and getting a refund directly deposited, then many of these tax laws, the money just appears. If you haven't been doing that, it doesn't. You have to do something. So, you know, if they if somebody put me in charge of the world, the first thing I would do is make sure that every American was entitled to a free permanent bank account. And where things like these benefits uh, would go automatically. There are lots of different ways to do that. Uh, some have argued for postal banking. Personally, I don't think that's the best idea. Um, I, I don't like going to the post office. I, but um, uh, so you, you can see that people are thinking about, okay, how can we help the bars and how can we help the restaurants? No one's thinking about how do we make this program have less sludge? Now, I will say that my co-author is working very hard in the Biden administration trying to reduce sludge from various aspects of the immigration uh, process, um, which is fabulous. So he's concerned about that, but there's no, there's no department that's in charge of that. And uh, I wish there were. Well, for the next question, this will be the last question before we hop to the audience Q&A portion. And I'm going to have to knock you down a notch and just say, okay, imagine you're not the leader of the world, but um, you're the leader of a small organization. And, and I'm sure a lot of people listening might be applying behavioral science, whether they're in a consultancy or maybe they're in a, a small government office um, or a nonprofit. And so I'd like to ask you, if you were advising that group, you know, what's one of the, the common mistakes you see organizations who want to apply behavioral science, want to create choice, be involved in creating choice architecture and nudges? Um, what's a mistake that they make? And, and what, would you, what advice would you give to help people not make that mistake? Well, the, let me talk about two things. One is, I think, you know, we have a, a new chapter about sludge in, in the final edition. Uh, sludge is kind of an, the anti-nudge. Um, our mantra is, if you want people to do something, make it easy. If, uh, if you make things hard, people will do less of it. Um, and I think there's lots of sludge in the world that could be eliminated if people were paying attention. Some of it is simply incompetence. Um, and some of that incompetence comes from knowing too much because of the curse of knowledge. So I, I was involved in a research project in which I had to fill out a bunch of compliance forms that I kept getting annoying emails reminding me that I hadn't filled them out. And so I finally went online and filled it out, three pages of stuff. And at the bottom, there was a button said finish, which I clicked on and then sent an email back to the nudger saying, okay, I'm done. And the next day I get an email saying, no, you're not done. So what do you mean? I'm done. I pressed finish. And she said, no, no, actually, uh, after you press finish, you have to go back to page one and press submit. Now, to me, finish means you're done. Finish. Don't say finish. If Say go back to page one. Now, you know, the person who wrote that code knew about the submit button and forgot that other people wouldn't know about it. The other thing I'll say is there's a lot of private sector sludge. People who follow me on Twitter know that I'm always ranting about uh, the difficulty of unsubscribing. I had an op-ed in the Washington Post about this, 
uh, I published it there because they are the major news outlet that does not require you to call or sing a jingle in order to unsubscribe from their newspaper. Um, and th in the class that I teach about managerial decision-making, the advice I give to companies is that you shouldn't do anything that you wouldn't want to appear on the front page of a newspaper. And that's not original to me. People have been saying that for a long time. It's a good line that I've stolen. And I think there is a question about whether, you know, there's a reason why all these publications are using this Hotel California subscription method that makes it easy to join and hard to leave. Um, and that is it makes money. Uh, I think you can make money by being trustworthy. And advertising, it's safe to subscribe because you can unsubscribe with one click. Uh, I wish more people would try it. Um, and I, I sp spent some time with a major Australian bank talking about this recently and said the, the only way to succeed at being the good bank is for people to trust you and you have to earn that. And I wish more companies in the private sector would take that as their mantra. All right. Well, on that note, we're going to shift gears. Um, and, and there is this uh, question about trust, which isn't an easy one. Um, there was a, there was a recent, um, I don't know if it's kerfuffle isn't the right word, but dust up in, in, a, in, a, in a recent study on PNAS about dishonesty. And it came out that the data were, were fraudulent. And so, um, you know, there are, that kind of brought a lot of people out of the woodwork saying, you know, I always thought this behavioral science thing was, was nonsense and it's evidence that it doesn't have a role to play. So, you know, you're, imagine you're, you're facing your, you know, one of the harsh critics, an audience member mentions a Washington Post article that, that quoted that behavioral economics was dead um, or quoted somebody that, that wrote an article that said behavioral economics was dead. So what, what's your thought on, on that, um, that take? And um, uh, I'll let you kind of dive in wherever you want, whether it be the data or that, the, the blanket statement about behavioral economics. So, you know, I wrote a book a long time ago called The Winner's Curse. And it was based on a series of columns I wrote in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, um, written in the late 1980s. And that book has gone out of print and the publisher got in touch and asked whether I wanted to do something and reissue it. And I've uh, dragged Alex Imus into this project. And um, there are 13 chapters in The Winner's Curse, and then there are half a dozen other columns that I wrote after the book. And in we haven't started really working on this book yet. Uh, I only do one at a time, unlike some co-authors. Um, but uh, what we've found is there's nothing that fails to replicate. There, there is no replication crisis in behavioral economics. Self-control problems have not gone away. Loss aversion is very real. Preference reversals exist. The ultimatum game, wherever you play it anywhere in the world, if you offer 1% of the pie, you're going to get turned down. So um, I won't go through all of them, but they, they all replicate and the effect sizes are all huge. That's why I picked them to write about 30 years ago and nothing has changed. Now, there are people who think loss aversion isn't real. Um, 
I think they've never run a version of the mugs experiment in their classroom. Um, I have hundreds of times and uh, it has never failed to get the usual result of mug owners demanding twice as much to give up a mug as um, non-owners are willing to pay to buy it. Um, that is loss aversion. Now there are questions in the level of psychology about what causes that behavior. That's a, a question for psychologists. To, a, to an economist, I'm done. Buying and selling prices are different. That I'm calling loss aversion. I'm also calling loss aversion the fact that people turn down a bet, win 200, lose 100. We know from Matthew Rabin's work, a co-author of one of those anomalies columns, that that cannot be risk aversion. It has to be loss aversion. Um, now, there's some, there are things like loss framing. Does How big is that effect size, whether you call, frame it as a gain or a loss? Uh, that's, that's weaker. Uh, you know, Dan Gilbert has argued that it's not really loss aversion. It's that they think there's going to be loss aversion and then it, they won't. Uh, you know, that's why he's a social psychologist and not an economist. Um, you know, I, I don't really care what we call it. Uh, I just want to predict behavior. So, you know, as for this study, um, the, I mean, we, we tried to replicate this sign at the top at the bit in London eight years ago. It didn't, didn't replicate. I, I wanted to believe that result, but, uh, didn't seem to work. Um, but notice that's essentially a priming effect. And Priming effects are pretty subtle and small and don't replicate. So, uh, you know, the fact that the experiments in that paper failed to replicate was not a shock to me uh, at this point. Uh, the fact that one of the authors made up the data, that's uh, pretty disturbing. And um, I wish he and everyone else would be a bit more forthcoming about that. Okay, and the, 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 this is kind of continuing with the, with the ethics, um, ethics uh, conversation, but moving it in maybe outside of the academic world into the, into the business world. Um, Hugh asks the, uh, that, the term nudging or nudge is, is becoming a buzzword for corporations with little understanding about behavior change. Is there a risk that, you know, um, in the, is there a risk that unethical application will become the behavioral tobacco of tomorrow? Um, I, I think one, one thing I'd add to that is to say that in the preface you mentioned um, uh, that the iPhone came out when the first uh, when the first book came out. And so obviously in the last 12 years has been this um, huge advance of tech. And that's where a lot of this behavior, um, uh, nefarious behavior manipulation conversation has, has sit, set, um, settled. And so I wanted to, I want you to think about maybe not only how uh, corporations might misuse nudge ethically, but how do you see tech playing into that? If, if you care to, well, to ask the, the first thing I would say is that the large technology firms are mostly really, really good choice architects. Um, you know, there's a reason why search is called Googling because it works. Uh, there's a reason Amazon um, has become the world's largest retailer because, you know, 
the seminary bookstore is wonderful and has a hundred thousand books, but imagine going into a, a bricks and mortar bookstore that had 10 million books. You would run away in fear. So the fact that, uh, and you know, things like Netflix, um, you can find what you want to watch pretty easily. And um, now, um, let's. there are things like the fact that if you're watching a show, uh, one ep- when one episode ends, the default is for the next one to start. And I'm not even sure whether you can turn that off. Um, you know, that, that's, that's, a, that's annoying. I put that in the annoying category. Um, it's not as bad as if they won't let me quit, which I, uh, I'm pretty sure Netflix allows you to quit um, just online. Um, so nudging you to watch another episode you know, opting out is pretty easy. I know where the off button is. Um, and now, the fact that these giant firms are good at choice architecture means that they some people are using it for marketing. And, you know, Amazon is running thousands of experiments every hour on all kinds of ways of selling you stuff. Uh, How much of that is ethical? I don't know. I I have no way of knowing. Um, Most of it is pretty transparent. Um, But here's what I would say, is there are huge opportunities to apply the principles of behavioral science and not just the ones we use in Nudge for all parts of business. And I think the place where there's the biggest opportunity is in human resources, which is the weak link in most large corporations. And uh, I had a... I had an interesting experience of introducing uh, Daryl Morey, who's the who was then the general manager of the Houston Rockets. He's now with the Sixers. Um, to uh, he and I had a conversation much like this at a large financial services corporation, and uh, I started it by pointing out that Daryl had 15 quantitative analysts working for him and his job was to hire 12 people, 12 very tall people. And uh, this company had 2,000 people. And I asked them, how many quants do they have helping them hire the best 2,000? Daryl's got 15 and he only is hiring 12. So I think the answer at most companies is zip. And the evidence for that is you still can't get a job without doing an interview, even though everybody who's watching this knows that unstructured interviews are almost completely useless. Um, And unless you're just using it as a, a way of discriminating against people that are unlike you. Uh, It's quite good at that. Um, So I think there's a revolution to be made and behavioral scientists should be leading it. And um, I hope that it happens um, in the next decade. Related to that, um, I'm, I'm curious what you think about uh, how people should be notified of of being nudged. Um, you mentioned Amazon's experiments. There's there's a really kind of gray area between um, design or 
and potentially nudging someone. So I'm curious if you might expand on that, especially for the people in the audience who are maybe UX designers or UI designers. Well, you know, I, I, I look, I don't know where to draw lines. It, if you go into a supermarket, a large supermarket chain has people who are uh, store walking choice architects and they will design the store. You know, there's an entrance and there are lots of subtle and not so subtle cues getting you to take a certain path through the store. And um, the milk is in the back. Uh, sometimes it's argued that that's because it's easier to keep cold stuff there. Um, I'm not sure I believe that. But the, the point is that the whole store was designed for two purposes. One is to give people a good shopping experience. You don't want it to be hard to find the things that you're there to buy. And also to make it likely you walk by things that are tempting and high margin. Now, should they have a sign above all the ice cream saying, warning, people are often tempted to buy ice cream if they walk by this aisle? I, I don't think they're obligated to do that. Uh, any more than they're obligated to uh, have a sign in the wine department saying that some people become alcoholics. Um, you know, uh, if, if people are intentionally misleading you, um, that's bad. Uh, but... Uh, you, you know, I don't. I would prefer it if the newspapers and magazines that make it difficult for you to unsubscribe warned you about that when they offer you the teaser rate for one dollar or one pound. Um, and in California, okay, here's something useful you will learn from this podcast. If you are subscribing to something and it's hard to unsubscribe, change your address to California and then try again. Because if you live in California, it's a law that you have to be able to unsubscribe online. Now, I wish other places had that law. Um, but in the meantime, Almost every place will let you change your address. And if you do that, uh, I'm told that uh, you will then be able to unsubscribe. So, um, yeah, I, I, there, there, are no, uh, there are fewer bright lines than we would like about what should or should not have to be disclosed. Um, but again, I believe that it's possible to succeed in business in with a business model that treats consumers the way you would want to be treated and earns their trust. And I think you can compete with the sleazy operators if you earn that trust. All right, so I'm going to promote you because you were you were leading the world. Then you were just an advisor. Now I'm going to promote you to the um, you know world uh, uh, vaccine final mile uh, strategy. So you're you're now um, somewhere in between where you started. Uh, uh, and and as we're, I mean, currently I'm I'm in Prague and I'm watching the graphs of flatten out of the number of people who've gotten the first vaccine in the second and, and are getting the second. And we're hitting, we're bumping up, I think around 56 to 60%, something like that. We need 75% um, according to the health minister before they'll open things up. So we're hitting the a really tough period. Um, there was work on vaccination lotteries in, in Philadelphia that um, 
We learned a lot about vaccination lotteries. They may not do the things we all wish they did, which was get more people vaccinated, although they are kind of fun and flashy. Um, and there's been some great research on that by Katie Milkman and others. Um, but we can't, we can't lottery our way out of this thing, we've learned. So, so you're advising the, the kind of this final hard mile of getting, getting to the 80%. What, what are some of the things you're, you're thinking about? Well, I, I think there there have been three stages of the vaccine rollout. Uh, in the first stage, and I'm talking about, say, uh, the Western world in uh, wealthy countries. Uh, the first stage, there weren't enough vaccines to go around. And um, the issues more were how do we uh, prevent the educated and wealthy from jumping the queue? Um, the second stage, we're getting to the less sure and procrastinators. That's probably the stage where things like uh, lotteries would have been effective. Uh, Katie and I wanted to run an experiment two years ago with flu vaccines where we would give people a lottery ticket when they showed up to get their flu vaccine. I still think that's the right way to do this. Say, we've got a lotto ticket and if you don't show up, we're gonna give it to somebody else. Um, but by the time uh, the Philadelphia experiments were run, uh, we were getting past that point. I think we're now, in stage three, where in lots of countries, particularly in the US, the people who are unvaccinated now have some pretty strong opinions. So they're not procrastinators. Uh, and I think we have to take sterner measures. Um, at my university, uh, classes are starting next week. Uh, if you want to show up here as a student, you have to be vaccinated. And if you want to be a faculty member here, you have to be vaccinated. Um, I think that's completely appropriate. Nobody has to come to the University of Chicago. If you don't want to be vaccinated, there are lots of good universities around the world and you can go study there. Um, whether governments should require that um, is a political question, um, uh, but I, I, th I think um, certainly the private sector, um, the, the National Football League has been extremely successful. Over 90% of the players are doubly vaccinated, and they did it by giving incentives to teams and players. Life is a lot easier if you're vaccinated and if you test positive and you're unvaccinated, you're gonna have to quarantine for two weeks. Um, I think that digital vaccination records are a no brainer. And I, I'm very frustrated with the Biden administration and uh, the Johnson administration in the UK who are confusing making the technology available with requiring everyone to have one. In the US, if you get a vaccine, they give you a piece of paper, too big to fit in a wallet, with things written in handwriting. This is looks like my report cards from first grade. I mean, wh wh what what are we thinking? Um, now, California and some other states have created digital records. It's possible to do. The problem is in the US, the vaccination records are being held in 50 different states. Lots of people are getting vaccinated 
in more than one place. People in Chicago were going to Indiana and Wisconsin to get vaccinated. We need a coordinated effort. And wh why do I want that? Well, if, um, if we're going to, there was a big rock concert in Chicago this summer, Lollapalooza. Uh, they required people to be vaccinated, but um, the, the the proof was showing your card, uh, which is easily forged. So, let, let, come on, guys. Let's have some 20th century technology. I'm not even asking for 21st century technology. And uh, let people swipe. Um to get into a restaurant or a bar if the owner wants to require that. Thanks for, thanks for exploring that question. So we, we've hit time. Um, so I'm going to, I want to say thank you to anyone that might have to leave to the next meeting. I want to ask you one final question. So don't go anywhere. Um, so thank you everyone. If you do have to hop, thanks for joining. Um, and you can listen to the recording and, uh, you know, you'll hear more from us um, at the Behavioral Scientist with, with that link. Um, for those of you who can stay, the, the final question I want to ask you is just is just a catch-all. You know, we've talked, we've covered a lot of ground um, uh, today. And so uh, what's something on your mind that we didn't get to talk about that, that you think is worth, worth discussing? You know, I'm not sure that if there's any big top. I mean, I think you hit the, uh, nothing is coming to mind. So maybe we maybe we can end this on time. All right, we can we can declare victory then. Um, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, uh, everyone for 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 joining all around the world. It was great to see people from from um, many different time zones um, um, chiming in in the chat and asking questions. And and thank you, Professor Thaler, for your time today and sharing your thoughts about choice architecture, nudge, behavioral science, and of course the final edition. Thank you, Evan, and thanks for everything you're doing at the Behavioral Scientist and. Uh, thanks for hosting this discussion. And uh, to everybody, what I've been writing on the book for the last 13 years, I continue to do, which is nudge for good, which is a plea. So thank you very much. Thank you.